what brings Arnold Klaus and this iteration uh, of his work uh, to the United States. One of the things that 601 tries to do is, is to be artist-centric. So in this case, Arnold Klaus has been making work for quite some time. It has been very influenced by not only uh, American photography, but even uh, by his journeys to the United States and across the United States. And uh, he has this rather consistent uh, relationship between text, writing, and, and photograph. And what I found in this uh, review of his work was that there was, in the early black and white work, there, was, there were affinities to, uh, to a certain lineage of black and white photography. Uh, Emmett Gowan comes to mind, some Frederick Summers work some things that I noted, but also this autobiographical instinct of the everyday, the, the, the attention to resonance and to uh, metaphor, but sometimes also enigma, the, the, the memory of things which are not understandable but yet present. For someone so interested in language and image, to actually be able to align some of his photographic inquiry into areas that are not easily easily described, and yet very specific when you look at the picture. And the collage is also, they're very accessible, but, you know, there's some leap of faith in some of it around, okay, why, are, why is this an affirmation that I should be looking for? Or what is, uh, in paying attention to these pictures, uh, what are the questions they raise for me? So I think some photographers try and answer questions with their work, and other photographers, it seems to me, raise questions. So there is an evolution to his work, and we're here partially because of that. Well, you, you mentioned so many things uh, that it har I can hardly, well, no, yeah. I know more or less what I going to try to say, which is very interesting because I have the Empire State Building in my yeah. <laughs> angle of view, which is so symbolic uh, of that uh, uh, when you, in your text when you say that it was not uh, that hard after all to look on the other side, to the other side of the pond, right, being the Atlantic uh, Ocean. And uh, this was to add to what you said by, about my background and the influence of American or, or a certain American photography in my vision. This is absolutely true. Uh, I just wanted to add another, uh, to uh, throw another light on my uh, background and my early, uh, early works. There was another influence uh, uh, other than French photography, which was uh, quite a strong influence, that was uh, avant-garde photography of the 20s, uh, the 1920s, uh, namely the Bauhaus, uh, which helped me to construct uh, my gaze. And uh, that's one aspect. The other uh, aspect uh, deals with the way I uh, coped with the very difficult question of what is it to be a photographer in, well, in this case in, in the mid-70s, in my early years, both because photography was, was taking a very important space in the cultural field, but also because uh, the big debate, debate was already what is medium specificity, it was still uh, medium specificity, specificity or not. And I think that pretty early in my career, uh, I made my opinion about this, uh, but I, I'm not going to say it uh, right now, because I like to... Uh, we can guess. Uh, well, <laughs> it's not as clear as you think. Yeah. Uh, and uh, as, uh, in my ammunitions, there are some things I would like to say about your work that I admire and uh, try to write a bit about. Uh, uh, that are not obvious, uh, in fact, not as obvious as they uh, seem to be uh, in terms of what is uh, medium specificity mm -hmm. or non-specificity. Um, anyway, and the third, uh, third aspect deals with my uh, uh, 
how could I say, my program, my, the agenda, you say an agenda, right? yeah. uh, that I gave to myself with photography, it was basically to be as present as possible. Challenge. On earth or yeah, challenge. challenge. Yeah, challenge uh, sounds a bit sports like to me. Uh, <laughs> no, but here you task, would say that. Uh, you yeah. would say you're the challenge. Well, All right. <laughs> French English <laughs> conversation. Uh, how is it possible to transmit a very strong sense of being present to the world? Uh, this is not. Uh, especially romantic or uh, exalted, what do you say? Uh, yeah, or, yeah, exalted. Yeah, exalted. It's very simple. And I found out that photography was a marvelous medium to uh, transmit that feeling. And uh, so, uh, and the, the last thing I wanted to say as a, as a new chapter to your introdu introduction is, uh, is my relationship to science. Uh, maybe it can seem a bit awkward uh, given the allure of my uh, visual work, but I'm very interested, I have been very interested for a long time in the science of uh, visual perception, Gestalt theory and all its consequences in the contemporary uh, research. And uh, uh, to give you a very uh, uh, eloquent example. I always take the example of uh, someone walking, I don't know, in the countryside or even in town and uh, noticing a cloud. So like, let's say that I notice this cloud because it resembles a horse. Uh, that can happen. That's what they call objective resemblance, right? Okay, I noticed it because it looks like a horse. It has the shape of a horse. What happens if I notice a cloud, even if it does not resemble any other object, it does, it's just this cloud. And uh, I uh, actually studied this problem uh, and it helped me to feed my photographic uh, work. Uh, and how do they cope with that in, in science, in psycho, psychophysiology, psychophysiology of uh, visual perception? In, in fact, this cloud that resembles to nothing than itself has been noticed because it is already uh, part of uh, the history of a culture. Clouds are an element in romantic culture, in the romantic art of landscape. Uh, they, uh, clouds have a whole history in, in human thought as vehicles or uh, symbols. Uh, that vary from culture to culture. In other words, uh, and that this is what I was uh, thinking of when I talked about uh, uh, our works that are not that different to, mm -hmm. to a certain extent. My opinion is that, in other words, I noticed this cloud because uh, I'm inhabited by these cultural mm -hmm. elements. So it's not pure subjectivity. I'm a collective subject, mm. and as I know that you're working as the idea of a collective subject, mm -hmm. or you know that uh, is supposed to replace the individual subject, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm not sure it's that clear. Yeah. Uh, I think we are all collective subjects. Well, I don't want to be too complicated uh, right at the beginning. Uh, but this is a good introduction to yeah. Right yeah, right. Yeah. So to, to, to the end of the introduction, true, I. My, uh, my aim, my, uh, my dialogue with photography uh, consists in trying to produce images that, uh, that are as, as obvious as possible, as evident, as easily readable, but that uh, conceal uh, complexities under these layers of, well, yeah, this is what is it, you know, a kid, a tree, lips, uh, mom walking by, or whatever, a man smoking at the corner of a, a 34th Street and 9th Avenue. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, um, because I think that uh, the best way to uh, transmit a sense of complexity is to appear uh, as, uh, I mean, for the images, uh, their, their best way to, uh, to uh, transmit complexity 
is to appear as very simple. I think that the complexities have to come as a second wave of you know, feelings, emotions, and intellectual and conceptual questions too. And the last thing, the very last thing I wanted to say, in France there is a, a current expression that distinguishes between photographers and artists using photography. Uh, but well, what is photo-based arts? Yeah, photo-based arts. Uh, but in France, uh, it's artists, it is on a photography, artists using photography, which sounds quite often a bit pretentious to my ears. What I, what I reply usually is, usually is that I'm a photographer using art. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm very, very interested in art, you know, all kinds of art, painting, conceptual art, electronic arts, video art, whatever. Maybe a way to talk about my work is um, the, so, you know, you were mentioning the collective and you mentioned the collective and also accidental authorship where I wouldn't actually term it accidental, I would term it in an incidental or inadvertent. And inadvertent. so there's an element of, um, so um, Dylan Flusser, who's a you both, people know who Philip Flusser is, he's a philosopher who is no longer around. Um, there's a video online of him on Vimeo somewhere on YouTube, and he's talking about photography, and he says, you know, there's this, this stream of events, and there's this machine, and the machine dips down into the stream and picks up an, an aspect of it and puts it up here, and that is a photograph. And um, and I feel like, uh, in a way, that's what you're talking about. You're talking about um, that you know the your practice is in some ways dipping down into this collective and pulling up the thing that's representative of the collective. And I guess if I were to make a distinction between that and how I function, I think I actually have forgotten about the machine altogether that dips down, <laughs> and I'm swimming in the stream with the collective and trying to assemble things in that space. And then of course, yeah, I'm taking them out of that and calling it art. Um, I w probably wouldn't call it a photograph because it's never a photo, you know, it's a million photographs or something. But, but there is something about this, um, you know, I, we were at this uh, lecture, or not lecture, discussion yesterday about post-internet. And I guess the one way that I would distinguish myself from that is that I absolutely believe in that authorship, you know, that I, that I do pull something out of there and say, well, this is what I'm saying about this at this moment. And so the individual versus the collective, I think, is interesting where, you know, every single person who makes a statement online with an image is an individual making an individual statement, but as soon as it crosses that threshold and enters that stream, it becomes part of the collective, myself included, and you, and you know. Right. And then, um, yeah, so I just, you know, and then I do have a relationship to my own individual way of looking at that, right? And so do you, I mean, it's, yeah. But so we're involved in the idea of the iconic and um, the, the subject matters that we both picked are different from each other, but you know, I'm interested in the fact that, that the sunset is the most photographed thing. <laughs> um, but I was actually thinking that there's another similarity in our works. And I, I was looking at these uh, today and thinking, there's an element of this, the, um, the deflated and isolated object. And um, the, televisions, the televisions from Craigslist that you mentioned and the suns from Flickr, they're all like, they're supposed to be, like the television is supposed to be, you know, the height of entertainment when you get this new thing and then, you know, people are selling them on Craigslist because they don't want them anymore. Or the sunset, you're taking this beautiful thing and yet you're one of 60 billion people that are doing it at the same time. Um, uh, the desks project that I did, but it, you know, the sort of the <laughs> financial failures of, of America and the world. 
Um, these are desks that are being sold, so the desk is no longer useful when it was once like this sort of site of productivity and clean, kind of modernist aesthetic. So all of these things, for me, uh, become singular in a, in a frame. And, um, and in their singularity, they're, they're lonely and isolated and deflated. And I actually think there's that kind of feeling in a lot of your work, too, that's very similar to... So, yeah.